Across the deserts of Libya, during the last decades of the Roman Republic, word reached the brave knight Murus of a monster that needed slaying. Now, this basilisk, a poisonous serpent that walked on many claws, was like no beast that he'd ever seen. But what was the purpose of a knight, if not to slay a creature such as this? So Marus rode to the basilisk's lair, lance at the ready. And when he found it, the beast was truly as grotesque a thing as the nightmare realms of rumor had ever conjured. But what match is a nightmare for a knight? Murus steadied himself, charged, and ran the basilisk through. But as the lance pierced the beast's heart, its venomous blood spread from the wound down the tip of the weapon, all the way up Morus's arm. But with a quick slash of his sword, Morus lopped his blighted arm clean off, stopping the poison and saving his life. Oh, the basilisk had breathed its last breath, but Morus had paid an extremely heavy price. Now, who wants to be the one to tell Morus that his boss should have just sent a weasel instead? That's awkward. Thanks so much to 80,000 Hours for sponsoring this episode. If you're looking for a career path where you can have a positive impact on the world around you, then stick around until after the episode, because they might be able to help you find your dream job for free. To the ancient peoples of Greece, Rome, and Libya, basilisks were known as the Little King, King of Snakes, for they bore a white crest upon their head in the shape of a crown. But the other serpents certainly didn't treat the basilisks as rulers. Actually, they ran from them. Well, slithered anyway. For basilisks were as poisonous to lizards as any other animal. Birds of prey would steer clear of a basilisk's toxic corpse. Even its own parents, a cockerel and a toad, wanted nothing to do with it. So basilisks would have lived quiet, lonely lives. You know, if not for all the humans trying to kill them. Killing a basilisk seemed an impossible task. But that's kind of what mankind does, right? Rise heroically to do the impossible. The moon landing, the polio vaccine, killing monsters, all part of that same theme. Now, Murus's crusade in the Libyan plains was just the beginning. Throughout the years, decades, and centuries, our ancestors went to war against these serpent kings. But with each brutal encounter, they'd learned that the beast was even deadlier than they'd previously thought. Just one bite could swell a man like a balloon, his flesh blackening and peeling away from the bone. Though most didn't even get close enough for a bite, it was said that the basilisk was so poisonous that its very breath could burn grass, and that it was so toxic that just a look from it would turn men into stone. But the basilisk had to have a weakness, didn't it? I mean, all creatures have weaknesses, surely. Well, eventually, it came to them. Or to put it more aptly, it scurried around their feet until they noticed. Weasels! Turned out, the odor of the weasel, poisonous to nothing else on Earth, was absolutely fatal to a basilisk. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Matt, I've never had a problem that I thought I could solve by throwing a weasel at it, so how exactly did the Knights of Antiquity realize that weasel stank would work? And that, my friend, is a very fair question. However, sadly, the specifics of that lore is lost to the ages, but maybe they simply happened to observe the two critters tussling in nature, right? Like spider and fly, snake and mongoose, bird and jet engine, you know, that kind of stuff. But although the smell of the weasel would affect the basilisk instantly, the king of all serpents still had a little fight left to give, enough to savage a little weasel with claws and teeth. So duels between basilisk and weasel would usually end like, say, Hamlet and Laertes, slashing each other with poisoned blades and succumbing simultaneously to the wounds. I imagine the heroic weasel would then expire in the arms of its furry family. Tell my story, the weasel would say. The rest is silence. It's also easy to imagine that when knights witnessed a weasel's improbable victory against a beast that had always bested them, they immediately militarized all the little stinky scurriers, banned them from showering, and threw them into underground basilisk dens, shouting things like, Weasel in the hole! But really, why did this work? Why weasels? Well, if you ask Pliny the Elder, who gave us the canonical account of the basilisk and its weaknesses, he'd say not to think too deeply about the apparent absurdity. There was no specific answer to the question, only that nature, or God if you prefer, always provides a remedy to its own creations. Achilles had his heel, the Death Star had its exhaust port, and you know, I'm sure that when the ashen stone of Mount Vesuvius rained down upon Pliny himself, he looked up and cried, Oh no, my one weakness! It was that simple. Basilisks trump man, weasels trump basilisks. And in that way, the humble weasel was given a purpose in the grand design, to protect all creatures in the world from the kings of snakes. 
But on the other hand, what the heck? Wasn't being heroic like supposed to be people's job? I mean, when God made the universe, he put humans at the center of it, right? So as the world moved into its Middle Ages, man began to play God. That is, man decided it should be allowed to kill the basilisk as well. I mean, why should weasels get all the glory, right? And to overcome its natural disadvantage, as man is often wont to do throughout history, we turned to technology. In 16th century Warsaw, a basilisk was said to be lurking in the cellar of a knife maker, its ruinous gaze making statues of all who bothered it. Now, apparently, there were no weasels on hand at the time. Must have been during the Great Weasel Drought of 1587, which you can totally see our fictitious 12-part series on here. So a former chief physician to the king was consulted for an alternative approach. His idea was to lower a man into the cellar dressed in a suit of mirrors. A convict was volunteered for the job, and when that shiny man was dangled into the dark and musty den, and the basilisk looked upon its own face, the physician's theory was proven correct. The basilisk succumbed instantly to its own power of statuification. Technical term. Ha <laughs> ha! A great victory for mankind that ended our impractical weasel dependency. Because if a guy in a mirror suit could do it, what hope did the basilisk have against a blunderbuss, right? A sniper in a helicopter? A drone-deployed bioweapon? All of that's to say, of course, given enough time, humans could kill a basilisk too. Because, and here's the important part, we wanted to kill it. I mean, how do you think William the Conqueror or Genghis Khan or Vlad the Impaler would have reacted if someone told them that there was a creature out there that they couldn't kill, but a frickin' weasel could? Nah, they wouldn't have let that stand for one second. Through technology and time, mankind outdid the weasel. We rewrote Pliny. We rewrote nature. We made ourselves the basilisk's predator. And if man could kill a basilisk, then hey, what couldn't we kill? So in many ways, the story of the basilisk is actually the story of mankind's journey of attempting to attain mastery over the natural order of things, to take control of that which was previously uncontrollable, and that there's no better answer to nature's perils than the human mind. That is, unless nature decides it needs to provide an answer to us, you know, like a bigger basilisk. <laughs> nah, that's ridiculous. Nature's probably gonna go with climate change on that one. Huh, I wonder how big of a mirror suit we'd need to fight that. Actually, in all seriousness, our world is facing a myriad of incredibly large problems that we're going to need to find solutions for. So with that in mind, we're incredibly excited to tell you about a sponsor today who's actively trying to move smart minds to those tasks by helping people like you find high-impact careers. And the best part is, you don't even have to buy anything. 80,000 Hours is a nonprofit whose goal is to help folks find fulfilling careers that have strong social impact. And their work, based on 10 years of research alongside academics from Oxford University, can help you find a job that makes a positive difference in the world doing something you love. Now, when we first started working with them a few months ago, we chatted with our 80,000 hours liaison, Bella, you know, to better understand their process, and she walked us through some of their services. We learned they have a ton of career research on their website for everyone to check out, lots of decision-making tools, such as their eight-week career planning course, and their podcast, which hosts unusually in-depth conversations with experts about how best to tackle pressing global problems. But I gotta be honest, what really got us excited was their job board, with just tons of listings that, based on all of their research, are gigs that have the best chance of helping you make the world we all live in a better place. And again, because they're a nonprofit that is philanthropically funded, there's no end game gotcha mechanic or hidden paywalls, just all of their material free always. So if that sounds like something you think would be helpful in your current job or help you in finding a new career that you can just feel great about, then you should definitely sign up for their free newsletter via the link below. When you do, they'll send you an in-depth guide that takes you through all the steps in making the best career plan for you and your 80,000 working hours that, on average, we're all going to spend in our lifetimes. Look, I know it's hard to figure out what you want to do with your life, right? Honestly, it took me way, way, way too long. But if you are feeling stuck or even just a little curious, you really should check out 80,000 Hours for yourself to see if they can help. Seriously, I think you'll be glad you did. Say, did you ever hear the one about Skylar Holmes, Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Mustia, Arcolite Games, Angela Valenciana, and Ahmed Ziad Turk being fantastic legendary patrons? Because I sure did. 